Good evening. Welcome to the Embrace Ambition series in San Francisco. I'm Gabrielle Raymond McGee, the Chief Operating Officer of the Tory Birch Foundation. We are so excited to be here on the West Coast with Embrace Ambition, and welcome to everyone tuning in to our live stream. The past two nights, we've had people from all over the world tuning in, and we would love to hear where you're watching from, so please share on social. This is the third evening of our week-long series across the country. Tomorrow, we'll be in Dallas, New Orleans, Boston, and Miami. Our series will culminate in Brooklyn this Friday on International Women's Day with Tori and my personal hero, equal pay activist Lily Ledbetter. So be sure to tune in. So why are we all here? We all know there is a negative stigma when it comes to ambitious women and girls. And this is why, two years, we set out to change this negative stigma through Embrace Ambition. We weren't sure what the response would be, but we had people from 98% of the world's countries as part of this initiative. And this helped us realize that we need to continue the conversation and our actions. And here are some of the facts and figures that we need your help changing, because there are current threats to all of us. 2.2%, that's the percent of venture funding for women. One out of 23, one out of $23 goes to a woman-owned business through loan capital. 11, that's the percent of women executives in Silicon Valley. And two, less than 2% 2 of women entrepreneurs will ever reach the million dollar mark in revenue. And if you're a woman of color, the stats are even more disheartening and unjust. But we know that all of the women and men in this room are going to change these numbers. The Tory Birch Foundation is committed to ensuring that all women can fearlessly embrace their ambitions. Our goal tonight is that you will be inspired to do something that will create change, to challenge the way we view ambitious women and bring this information back to your companies and communities. So if you are waiting for a sign to make an impact and roll up your sleeves, this is it. And guess what, you're in great company. When we kicked off our series, we knew we wanted an audience that would be diverse and rooted in the local community. And this is why we invited women to apply online to attend. We asked women to write essays and share how they're shattering stereotypes and how they're embracing their ambition. And the response was remarkable. In the first 24 hours, we received more than 1,200 essays. Our tiny foundation team read every single submission. More than 2,000 beautiful, personal stories of resiliency, strength, and determination. So tonight, you will hear from some of these extraordinary women. We'll begin and end the program with their stories. After hearing from two of the incredible women that have shared their stories, you will hear from 13-year-old scientist, Jatanjali Rao, then, venture leaders Tracy Chow, Hadia Mujahid, and Shelley Kapoor Collins will take the stage. These women are shattering stereotypes, age, race, socioeconomics, and of course, gender. And tonight would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor, PayPal. Thank you, where's PayPal? Thank you for being such a tremendous partner. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Tiffany Walker Carter, head chef of Bouge Deli, to share her story. She will be followed by Ashley Chu, executive director of She Stems. Tiffany? Hello. Hi. As a young African American woman, I found myself isolated in a dominated chef world. Coming from public housing, being a young teenage mother, I've literally surpassed every stereotype and, and obstacle to become an entrepreneur in my budding food empire. When I studied at Le Cordon Bleu, there were very few people that looked like me, but this didn't hold me back from being a chef at the top of my game. 
Because of the stereotypes that I've overcome, I am committed to paying it forward by hiring black women, immigrants, and other women that are often overlooked. This year, Boo's Jelly will be one of the premier delis of the Golden State Warriors as we enter into the new Chase Room. <laughs> Thanks in part to a business loan from the Tory Burch Foundation Capital Program powered by Bank of America. I want to empower people in my community through job creation and mentorships. My ambitions are unstoppable. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Chu, and I'm uh, from Alameda High. Um, and I'm going to share a little story on how um, I embrace and my ambition. So the morning of my first high school hackathon in 10th grade, I jumped out of bed, excited to experience the thrill of coding a project in 24 hours with other passionate strangers. But upon arriving at the hackathon, my clunky ThinkPad immediately clashed with the sleek MacBooks of my teammates. A realization struck me. I was the only girl on an all-guys team. They were captains of the robotics teams and developers for startups, roles that I never thought were feasible. An incessant pang of imposter syndrome hovered over me, and although I yearned to type lines of code, my fear of typing a mistake replaced my curiosity and passions with inferiority. The following year, I attended a major tech conference as a scholar. I was so excited to learn from the world's best, but that feeling quickly subsided as I realized that the only people presenting and taking center stage were men. Not a single woman had the opportunity to present on cybersecurity or VR or robotics. Women were only tasked with making general announcements. I found my, myself alone again. Where? In line for the bathroom. <laughs> there was literally no line, and yet across the hallway, the men's bathroom snaked around the conference venue. For the first time, I wished for that woman's bathroom line to be longer. And compelled to take action, I created She Stems. Today, She Stems is a national nonprofit spreading from California to Tennessee that has impacted over 200 low income girls. Through free programs, including workshops and summer camps, I am able to see girls walk into She Stems programs eerily silent on day one, transformed to proudly presenting projects together by the end. Within a year, my one silent voice transformed into a loudspeaker, sharing my passion and cracking the glass ceiling for the girls following behind me. Pipeline will no longer be an excuse for why women aren't given center stage at major tech conferences, and I look forward to seeing longer bathroom lines soon. Thank you, Ashley. That was amazing. So speaking of amazing, when the water crisis hit Flint, Michigan, the world was quite slow to respond. But our guest here today jumped into action. Jatanjali Rao is a 13-year-old eighth grader from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. She was named America's top young scientist by the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge and she has a patent pending device to detect lead in water faster than any other current techniques. Jatanjali was recognized on Forbes 30 under 30 when she was 12 years old. <laughs> she has not one, not two, but three dynamic TED Talks. Yes, wow indeed. <laughs> She believes strongly that STEM is as important as learning to read and write, and in her spare time, she volunteers with Children's Kindness Network. She enjoys baking, playing piano, and being a big sister to her six-year-old brother. It is such a joy to welcome Jatanjali to share her ambitions with us. Jatanjali. Seventeen point six million people, five thousand water systems, and five million lead pipes still in the system. These statistics represent the state of our water quality 
and the extent of contamination. How many of us are absolutely sure that the water we are drinking is safe and contaminant free? How often do we test for lead contamination in our water? Why would we? It all started about three years ago when I learned about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Did you know that peak lead levels reached 127 parts per billion? That's nine times as much as the EPA standards for critical status of lead at 15 parts per billion of lead. I just couldn't accept the fact that there was a city in our country where children my age were exposed to a poison every day that caused lifelong damage to their mental capacity, vital organs, and even normal growth, all just because they were using water in their daily lives. To add on, this wasn't just a problem happening in Flint. This was happening all around the world, and we needed to do something about it. I started to look at what I could do. And in the beginning, I wanted to completely eliminate lead out of water. But when I thought about it, it was really complex, and it was like solving global warming with just one solution. <laughs> but digging deeper, I found that the lack of knowledge of contamination and the extent of contamination was the bigger problem, as it kept people away from taking action and finding alternatives sooner. So detection became my primary focus. And then I start to look at what was already done. So some of the current solutions in the market today are either test strips, which are easy to use and fast, but aren't the most accurate thing in the world, or sending your water to a local water facility to get it tested, which is super accurate, but it's also time consuming, inconvenient, and requires a lot of expensive equipment as well. So that really added on to a need for a solution as well. So um, I, this is when I moved on to the phase of looking at what I could do or what I could do with my invention. So I came across an article on MIT's page where they were using carbon nanotube sensors to detect hazardous gas in the air. And I decided to expand that idea to apply for liquids to be able to detect lead in water. So let me tell you a little bit about my device. I named it Tethys after the Greek goddess of fresh water. Um, Tethys consists of three main parts. It has a core device with a processor, an inbuilt Bluetooth, a disposable cartridge, and a smartphone that connects over Bluetooth to be able to display your results. So how it works is you dip the cartridge into the water you want to test. The cartridge includes a carbon nanotube specially doped with chloride ions. So when it's dipped into water with lead, the lead in the water binds with the chloride ions forming lead chloride molecules. This increases the amount of resistance to the flow of current and decreases the conductivity. The conductivity drop is correlated to the severity of the lead compounds in water. So to make it easier for the user, I added an Adafruit processor to measure all resistance and current values, and it has inbuilt Bluetooth low energy protocols so it can send the data to your mobile phone once you connect over it on an app that I created, which gives you values of either safe slightly contaminated or critical of the lead status in your water. So that's a rundown of how the device works. Um, so while I've been tackling the water contamination problem, I want to tell you a little bit about something else that I've been starting up and researching on. So one of the other biggest problems that is still happening now is the prescription opioid crisis, which is a huge problem. So um, some of my research wor recent work has been about tackling that problem. So I've created a device for early diagnosis of prescription drug addiction. And it's able to tell you if you're at the onset of addiction, if you're completely out of addiction, or if you're already addicted to certain prescription drugs. So 50,000 people every year die from that. And I early detection and early diagnosis could have helped many people, and I believe that my new device has the potential to help others with that as well. So the next thing I want to touch on is that through the journey of innovation, I wouldn't have been here, or I wouldn't have even had a device without the support of my mentors along the way. Innovation needs support and it needs mentors. It needs companies and individuals that foster independent thinking. 
So I want to thank all of my mentors for being there and supporting me whenever I needed it. And I'd like to request one thing from all of you. It would be that you seek a mentee and mentor them in the areas that they are passionate about. And I can tell you from personal experience, it has really made a difference for me. So lastly, I'm a girl in STEM. And by the self, most people's instant reaction is, so what? But um, let me tell you a personal story. So recently, I was excited to join a STEM lab. And I wanted to make new friends and learn about new topics. But when I got there, it was me and seven other boys. And my instant reaction was that I didn't belong here at all. Because if, if you go somewhere and it's you and seven other boys, you don't feel like it's a place where you belong and you don't feel like it's made out specifically for girls. Or, but it, the funny thing it was it was advertised the same for everyone. So I was really, really mad about it, but I was also really upset about it too. But by the end of that lesson, I ended up loving what we were doing so much that it didn't matter to me who I was around. So somewhere in our mind, each one of us want to be with the group that we are a part of. And I personally, when I got there, it was, I wasn't with the group that I was part of. My friends were all going to a movie or doing something else while I was there building a robotic car. And I, I would have much preferred to build a robotic car than go to whatever movie they were watching. Um, but if there's one thing I want to change in this world, it would be to ensure that girls are provided a safe space to be able to pursue STEM and show their passion for STEM. So research shows that girls get in, don't get into STEM necessarily, or girls get into STEM necessarily for different reasons that guys get into STEM. So while girls look at more of the creative and artistic aspects of it, boys like to look at the technical and problem solving and step-by-step -step aspects of it as well. So if we're able to understand that, I hope to see a day where community clubs, schools, and organizations provide a space like this for all girls. And I want to end this off with one of my favorite quotes from my favorite scientist, Marie Curie. We've come a long way, but we still have so much more to do when we look ahead. If we all try to recognize and alleviate the problems that our fellow citizens face, we can make the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs> Well, <laughs> so I think the question is, what were all, all of us doing when we were 13, right? <laughs> Not building robotic cars and solving the opioid crisis. But um, we are so humbled to have you, Jatanjali. Uh, you epitomize a, a woman who's shattering stereotypes. So tell me, you you learned about the Flint water crisis when you were about nine, and then you created your device around 11, is that right? Yes. Um, so tell me more about how you feel about age and defying that, that stereotype that you have to be a certain age to do something. Right, so as I, you know, I, I started to love science and inventing since second grade, and it, it or I loved science since I was three, um, I ended up loving inventing since second grade, um, or as I called it, using signs for kindness. Mm. Um, but I, I always saw that none of my friends or nobody else in my class were creating inventions. And it was always my question why. But then in the news, I kept seeing all of these big companies and everybody releasing new products and inventing new things to solve big problems and I always question why and now that I see it it's because many people think that if you're a certain age or certain gender you can't necessarily do the same things that others can do mm -hmm. which I look at as wrong um, I'm 
I like to tackle problems and I like to go for them. And it's not because I'm an adult or I'm a male. It's mm -hmm. because I am doing what I love to do. Mm -hmm. So I per personally think it doesn't matter to me what your age is or your gender or your race or anything. It just matters that you are doing what you love to do and following your passions. I mean. <laughs> So it's very clear you've always been a woman of action. What would you say to people tuning into the live stream and the folks here of how to have the confidence to just do it? I, th I Ever since I've just seen the news, I've always had that urge to solve a problem before everyone else does it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just because I look at our entire world as one big community and that we it's all of our duties to help each other. Um, so that we don't leave the planet in a gross state for this generation and upcoming generations. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think it's important that for everybody tuning in and everybody here, it's important that we do our, first of all, our everyday things. Like, you know, just being mindful of what we throw in the trash can, what we throw in the recycling bin, not littering. Like those small things, because collectively that's going to make a difference. Um, but then something else is continuing to support the efforts of um, teens like me mm -hmm. who are continuing to event, invent or being able to, um, I guess, motivate and uh, like push almost to an extent. Like be able to coax, or co coax is a weird word. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, push empower through. Empower, mm -hmm. there. Empower more girls or empower more students to be involved with STEM as well. I think that's definitely going to be what our future depends on. So when you were going through your process, did you have self-doubt when I know not all the labs wanted to host you yeah. while you were experimenting, right? So how did you continue to have that confidence despite people turning you away and saying, you're too young to do this? I think every five minutes was just self-doubt. <laughs> like, so it's okay to have self-doubt. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, in the beginning, I, I was almost positive this was just, this idea of mine was just going to go beyond, like, it wasn't, it was just going to be an idea. Mm -hmm. um, but here it is as a full-fledged product today. And so it really shows how limitless um, mm -hmm. you can be. And, but what I see is that I've, I, it's always been, for me, I've always had like some aspect of self-doubt and I'm starting to get over that now. Um, but then for others, like labs and things like that, most of the responses I got back from them when it was email, my, what I always thought was the ideal response is when somebody got back to me and they said, no, we have everything laid out for you. All you have to do is come in here and do your tests. And that's what I was expecting from my first email that I sent out. And next day I get a response back that says, sorry, we don't have the time. Mm. And it was, it's always discouraging the first time you hear that. But um, I kept trying. I kept reaching out. And eventually I figured out that Denver Water um, was able to help me. And... Um, I was talking to you earlier about how many people thought of it as an 11-year-old with a science fair project um, and didn't really take it seriously as somebody who wants to solve a big problem. Mm -hmm. But I think now people are starting to look at it more seriously because they're seeing these problems come to life. And you're creating solutions for these yeah. problems, <laughs> which is most important. So you've talked a lot about mentorship. How has your mentor shaped you? So... Uh, my mentor has really, I've, I've had a lot of mentors along my paths, and they've really just, gave, they've given me advice, but then they've also helped me in ways which aren't necessarily giving advice. They've just helped me in terms of how, as a person, I would say, in general. Mm -hmm. So there's always aspects of maybe you can use a, 1,000 ohm resistor instead of a 100 ohm resistor for the device. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then there's also ideas of never be afraid to try mm -hmm. or never be afraid to ask, which, which are some of my biggest fears, where asking others for help or 
just trying because I was just so afraid that I was going to fail. Um, another piece of advice is just to slow down. Um, I was always ready to go and experiment um, when I literally had nothing planned out. Mm -hmm. I was ready to kill myself at that point with lead. <laughs> um, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> um, but I, it was a lot of, um, I guess, shaping me of who I am. And are you mentoring other people? I am. I, I mentor a lot of students. Um, and I've done a couple clubs and first Lego League teams with how they can improve their ideas and how they can how they can develop it so it can actually become a viable product. So mentorship can start at any age, yeah. which is great. So tell us, what does ambition mean to you? You're obviously quite ambitious. Mm -hmm. What does that word mean to you? So I look at it as two different things. So there's one which is taking initiative and then persistence. So for the persistence idea of things, um, it, it's a whole broad category. It's like not being afraid to try or ask, like I said, or not taking no as an answer. Like keep pushing through any obstacle that gets thrown my way. And then for the initiative side of things, it's still being able to look at a problem and understand the need for a solution. Mm. And if anything gets thrown my way, like commit to it and tackle it and make sure that the world is in a good place and it's, it's a better place. Well, it's a better place because you're here, which is great. <laughs> so you've talked a lot about STEM and empowering young girls through STEM, and you've also talked a lot about equal pay. So I don't think you get a paycheck yet, right? <laughs> but tell us why, why is that important to you, equal pay? Yeah, so I'm actually writing an essay about it for social studies class right now. <laughs> um, but Of uh, course you are. <laughs> Um, but the wage gap, or the gender wage gap, is a topic that's of interest to me. And the reason is it's really similar to, I guess, stereotypes that we see about, like, girls in STEM, too. Mm -hmm. um, I guess to an extent, for the same job in the same amount of time that a woman does as a man does, um, a woman receives 80 cents for every dollar a man gets, which I see is so unfair. Mm -hmm. It's like saying... Um, for if a girl builds a device and a boy builds a device, the girl gets uh, the girl gets less lab space or less opportunities to be able to share her device than the boy does, mm -hmm. which is unfair because it's still solving a big problem, and so it, it's it, it's just another idea of a st stereotype which I really interested in tackling and really interested in crushing. <laughs> we want you to crush it, Chitanjali, that's for sure. So, so I know you have a whole step process that you've recommended to other people, and I know everyone here would love to hear it. So many people in this room are entrepreneurs and Tory Birch fellows, and we want to know, step by step, what do you recommend to get something done? Yeah, so I call it Gitanjali's five-step process. It's really cliche, but it sounds good. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, the, the first step is to observe. Um, it's, it's my go-to step. Like, I'll, I'll just be going on a walk. I'll see a leaf, and I'll be like, that leaf is crooked. I need to fix it, or some, uh, something like that. And um, it, it, observing is the first step to any problem that you come across. Flint water crisis, saw it on the news, I observed it. Um, opioid addiction, read it in a magazine, I observed it. And so there's like a whole bunch of these problems that come out like this. Um, one of my earlier devices was a snake bite diagnostic tool um, for remote How areas. How did you observe that? Um, <laughs> I think it was just a documentary. Okay. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. Hopefully you didn't I, get I didn't get bitten by a okay. snake. No, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and then the next step is to brainstorm. Um, this is when you have this problem, but then you start to look for how can you solve this problem? What type of what type of invention can you create? Can you? And it doesn't need to be always an invention. It can be what movements can you start or what. What well, organizations or clubs can you um, start or begin to help with this cause or something like that? Um, the third step is to research. 
And so how are you going to go about doing this? Um, figuring out all those little details, whether you're going to use a 1,000 ohm resistor or a 100 ohm resistor. That's the question <laughs> for everyone here, right? Um, and then the fourth step is to build. Research is my least favorite part of the process because it's at a computer. And you get bored eventually. Um, next step, building, which is my absolute favorite part because it's like taking this idea that you've drawn on paper and making it a reality. Mm -hmm. And so you have the 3D printers going or cardboard um, cutting. Or chemicals. Or chemicals right. mixing, yeah. Um, and so it's everything like being put together and coming up with something which is like your life <laughs> pretty much or something you are now devoted to. It's like my tethys is my something like my baby. Like I take care of it. It's like something I build for, with my own hands. So it's really important, something that you're always close to. And then the last step is to share your results and like be able to spread awareness like I'm doing right now about the problem, the issue, and what you're doing to help solve it. Did everyone get that? <laughs> you can now spring into action. So Jatanjali, you're 13. Yes. 13 years from now, you're doing what? Mm, so this could either go two different ways. Oh, okay. So um, I want <laughs> I want to be in a lab, like working in a lab, doing hands-on things. But then simultaneously, I also want to be ideating products, like running good an organization, being an entrepreneur, um, creating like huge um, like biomedical devices is something that I'm really looking at. Okay. Um, yeah, as like that, that's really what I'd love to do. I want to be a geneticist when I grow up um, and work in the field of epigenetics. So using gene editing, which I'm obsessed with, to cure diseases, which um, it, it sounds really life-changing. So that's something I'd like to work around. Well, we want you to do that too. <laughs> um, but breaking news, Jatanjali for president is what I say, <laughs> right? <laughs> So Jatanjali, what can everyone do to support your mission? How can we help? How can we be part of what you're doing to empower girls, empower kids? I think that uh, continuing to support these efforts is the biggest and most valuable thing that everyone can do at this point. Um, and it's starting to become more of a real thing, which is, which I, it's really awesome to see that happening. Um, like being able to understand the need for this and um, like, I guess with more kids being involved in STEM, like what I said in my speech earlier, like mentoring other people, no matter you know, what you do or how you do it, it's important to Share your knowledge with somebody else because I know many of the people I mentor now I learned many of those skills from my mentor mm -hmm. too And so it's like a chain so when somebody mentors somebody else that somebody else can mentor somebody else else <laughs> <laughs> And so it's and those traits keep getting passed down and so eventually we'll Have a revolution of kid yes. inventors yes. if that makes sense. Yeah, and so don't have to worry about any of the big problems that we see today, hopefully. Yes. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I think we can all agree that Jatanjali is a reminder that it's never too early to embrace your ambitions. So thank you for being thank you. here with us, Jatanjali. So now it is a great honor to welcome three women who are shattering stereotypes and not just talking about why diversity matters, but they are proving it. You can sit up here with me. You can stay with me. Uh, they are taking Silicon Valley and the world by storm through the use of data, tech, investing, and initiatives to design a diverse venture and entrepreneurship landscape. Please join me in welcoming Shelly Kapoor Collins, CEO of the Shatter Fund, Hadia Mujahid of HBVUVC and co-founder of Black Founders Startup Ventures, 
and Tracy Chow, CEO and founder of Block Party. Um, before we get started, I have one quick question for Gitanjali. How are your products funded? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So um, I do. I do have an investor. So um, uh, the female quotient, um, they're investing in my product and they've been working with me and there's an incubator in Tennessee who's been working with me and looking at the commercial viability of my product as well and then plus a lot of the prize money I've received from these competitions which is um, which is amazing it's really helped me fund my device that's cool well I think you're gonna let's talk after this okay <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to get okay. a term sheet. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, thank you for being here tonight. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having us to the Tory Birch Foundation. Um, pleasure to be here um, with both of my co-panelists. And as we all know, we're here today to talk about, di about diversity and why it's so critical to our communities and organizations. But it's not always about how much a woman embraces ambition. It's also about organizations and companies creating equal opportunities safe environments, and diverse work workforces, and transparent opportunities. Anything for the sake of just doing it is not going to get you very far. You have to really buy in and believe in a mission. And that passion, when you believe in something, is what drives change and delivers success. Diversity is not, and should not, be a quota. Incorporating diverse practices to include different points of view, and people should be a way of life to the point that we no longer one day need the word diversity. At the end of this conversation today, my hope is that everyone who's here in this room, who's tuning in, who's listening to this conversation, who reads about it, is gonna walk out of this and say that, you know what, diversity is not a buzzword, it's not a nice to have, it's a way of life. What am I gonna do to make that happen? So with that, I'm gonna give myself a quick, inter a quick introduction and then go on to my co-panelists. So I'm Shelley Kapoor Collins. I started the Shatter Fund to invest in technology companies that are founded by female entrepreneurs. When people ask me what I do, I tell them I invest. And their responses are pretty funny. Sometimes people will say, oh. And I'll say, wait, I invest in women. And, then, <laughs> and they'll say, oh, really? Cool. That's kind of great. But you can tell they're surprised. Women need investment? We do. So about a year ago, I'll tell you a story that, um, that kind of drove me to where I am and um, makes you realize how much of a change is needed in this space. About a year ago, I met a prominent VC and I went in to pitch her on Shatter. And um, you know, we started talking about my investment thesis and what I'm doing. And she asked me you know, at the end of it, which was a compliment, and she meant it that way, she said, you could have gotten a job with any VC in the Valley. Why'd you start Shatter? That's a good question. And so I thought about it and I told her that, you know what, you're right. I could have gone to any established organization and I could have gotten the infrastructure that was in place. But I traded that infrastructure for the ability to start my own fund because the cultural change that needs to be made has to start with me. I have to be the change that I want to see. It starts at the top and it goes up from the bottom. And she said, I like that. She said, come back when you're <laughs> ready to start a job. And the way I see it is, I don't want a job. I want more. And that's my ambition. I want more. I always want more. Because if I want more, then the people I'm extending a hand to will also want more. So with that, um, Shatter Fund was my way of shattering the stereotype of helping women get the access to capital that they need. Um, that is my way of doing. And I'm a big believer in no op-eds there's a call to action, and my call to action is to invest in female entrepreneurs. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my co-panelist, Hadia. Hi, um, so you, as you mentioned, I'm Hadia Mujahid. I'm the CEO and founder of HBCU VC. We're a social impact mission um, where we are focused on creating more black and Latinx um, 
entrepreneurs, investors, fund managers, um, for the ultimate goal of creating jobs and wealth for communities of color. And I'm gonna actually share a little bit story of what, um, a small story of how I got to where I am today. So I'm starting to realize that my grandmother, um, my Jamaican grandmother, um, has a huge influence um, in the way that I see uh, the world and also part of my career motivations. So um, I know we're supposed to be breaking stereotypes here, but there is a Jamaican stereotype. Um, and there's this show called uh, In Living Color a long time ago. I remember In Living Color. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> well, well, there was this skit about Jamaicans and um, Jamaicans having multiple jobs, right? And the joke was, uh, how, many, how many jobs do you have, right? Um, and so that was my grandmother. My grandmother, in the sense of being an entrepreneur, she had multiple uh, businesses. She ran a cleaning business where a lot of my um, aunts and uncles worked at. Uh, she ran a restaurant, which um, during the weekends, I was happy to run the cash register. Um, <laughs> and she did all this while holding down a full-time job for the city of Philadelphia. Right? And while um, she leveraged her position as an entrepreneur to actually help sponsor people from Jamaica to come over. And so I lived with her for a good portion of my childhood. And so there was always someone on our couch. And um, one of the things that I am learning later in life is, um, again, how my grandmother used her, her position, her privilege as an entrepreneur to put others in a place of success. And so the way that I view my work uh, through HBCUVC is that we want to create more Loretta's. Loretta's is the, is the name of my grandmother. Uh, we want to create more people like you who are using their privilege to and put you. other people's people, thank you, um, in a place of success. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. And Tracy, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy. Um, I am CEO and founder of Block Party, which is a new baby startup I just founded less than three months ago. So it's still a little bit scary to talk about. <laughs> but uh, what we're working on is tools for people who are getting harassed and abused online, uh, since there is unfortunately a lot of this um, kind of unsavoriness on the internet today, and platforms are not doing nearly enough to support people who are on the receiving end of it. How I got here is, um, in some ways, a very typical Silicon Valley story, in other ways, not so typical. So I grew up in the Bay Area. Both my parents were software engineers and have uh, PhDs in computer science. And I went to school at Stanford and studied electrical engineering, computer science there. And I did internships at Google and Facebook. So it seems very obvious that I would end up here in tech. Um, but what was a little bit unusual actually is that I felt these really strong headwinds pushing against me the whole time, even though I actually do fulfill a lot of the stereotypes, being Asian and good at math and science and engineering, um, and being very quiet. Um, it felt difficult and um, uncomfortable, and something just felt incorrect about me being in tech and in engineering, and there were a lot of little things, um, in hindsight I know, or. Uh, there's, I now know the terminology for all these things, like microaggressions. Um, but at the time, I didn't know what was happening. Um, and so I felt a lot of this pressure to leave tech or move into non-technical roles. Um, I eventually did end up becoming a software engineer when I graduated. Um, and it was a roll of the dice. I didn't actually know what engineering would be like. Uh, despite having two degrees in engineering, I didn't actually know what it would be like to work as a software engineer until I started doing it. So I went to an early stage startup, Quora. Um, it's a question and answer site. And I joined there um, as the third employee and the second engineer hired. And so we were really building something from the ground up. And it was that sort of marvel of creating something from scratch that um, really showed me how powerful it is to be creating technology, being in that um, driver's seat of writing the code. Mm. Um, and after Quora, I worked at Pinterest. Um, I was there also very early. I joined when it was about 10 people and left when it was about 1,000. So I got to see that sort of scaling, which is really incredible. It's a very cool Silicon Valley rocket ship story. Um, and alongside the engineering career I had, I also started doing more around diversity and inclusion unintentionally. Um, but when I was at Pinterest, which was a very supportive environment, um, I still looked around and saw that there weren't that many women in engineering, and I felt a little bit out of place. And at some point, I um, kind of ruminating online, wrote a Medium post asking for transparency around diversity data. 
And uh, it was so hypocritical to me at that point that there was no data around diversity in tech companies. And we talked about it, um, but without the data, people would often say, oh, it's not really that bad of a problem, or they could kind of paper over it. Mm -hmm. um, and once that data came out, um, we could see how bad it was and try to drive more change. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen very much progress in the last few years. Hopefully, we'll start to accelerate that. Um, but in the process of uh, that whole journey, um, working on diversity data, I also ended up co-founding a nonprofit called Project Include, which works on diversity and inclusion for tech startups. So all these different threads are coming together. So I worked in engineering, worked at platforms uh, with lots of user-generated content. I also was um, very intrigued by the process of designing communities and um, how to get good content and good users onto these platforms. And uh, working at Quora and Pinterest, I thought a lot about moderation and how do we set norms in these communities. Um, and some of it was because I was getting harassed on these platforms, even when they were very early. Uh, and so I've tried to build in the tools to block people or um, encourage more civil behavior. Um, and in the process of doing more activism work, um, I've become a little bit more uh, just active on Twitter and these different platforms and have been on the receiving end of harassment and abuse. Uh, and so now I get to take advantage of my engineering background and my experiences building platforms and the connections I've built up in Silicon Valley to actually try to solve a problem that affects me and many other people who aren't getting this problem solved. That's great, thank you, wow. So that actually brings me to my, my first question, and you've already hit on it, which is that, you know what, we knew that something needed to be done. Not much was being done. You've talked a little bit about your data collection. I would go to Hadia and say, you know, we are all people of privilege here, right? We, all, we have an education. We have the ability to impact change. Privilege means that doors open for you. You have certain levels of access. How are you, Hadia, using your privilege, which is actually power, to elevate the diversity um, dialogue that we're having into action? Um, so a couple of ways. One, through my organization, um, sharing my experiences. Uh, I, I work with students at historically black colleges and universities. Um, so sharing my experience with them, teaching them and coaching them to be the next generation of entrepreneurs and investors. So that's one way. Another way is um, platforms like this. You know, uh, sharing our story, uh, sharing our work. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's one way of uh, using our privilege uh, to, Absolutely. to direct action. I couldn't agree more. And Tracy, do you have, what more do you have to add to that in terms of how you're taking your power clearly and using it? You know, you're using it in one way, which is on social platforms, but what, are, you know, what else are you doing that we don't know about? Uh, so Project Include worked with a lot of different tech startups to try to implement more diversity and inclusion best practice. Um, so we have a lot of different guidelines there and have um, programmatic offerings as well. Um, another effort I was involved with starting is something called Moving Forward. So after all the revelations around Me Too and pervasive harassment, um, this is particularly dangerous in the investing and um, entrepreneurship realm because there's no official relationship between investors and founders before an investment is actually made. So none of these relationships are protected. Um, there's a lot of harassment going on and that power imbalance of these investors holding um, capital and them being the gatekeepers to this um, money that the entrepreneurs need led to a lot of abuse in that ecosystem. Um, and so with moving forward, what we are trying to do is get venture capital firms to actually have anti-harassment policies that cover founders, which doesn't seem like it should be uh, that mind-boggling, but it turns out that m most of these firms didn't have any policies. Um, so we asked a lot of these firms, now we have over 100 firms that have uh, created and published their policies so that founders can be protected and they have points of contact to go to. So some of these things are not very exciting in some ways, like we're just trying to get them to have some sort of legal framework. Um, but, but they're so needed. Yes. Right? And you're finally, someone is brave enough to talk about it and to take action and make it happen, so that's wonderful. Um, I would add to that, just because all of us, you know, both of you have more than one organization that you started, I feel the need to say that I have started another <laughs> organization. Um, but um, to answer the question of privilege to power, one thing that we've noticed is, you know, funding, you know, not only are there not enough women getting money that they need, there's not enough women being able to invest because they don't have um, 
the, the wherewithal. They may have the financial ability, but they don't know how to vet a deal or they don't have the access to due diligence. And so what we've decided at Shatterfund to do is to help um, both of those very important um, ecosystems come together, the female investors and the female founders. And so therefore, in honor of International Women's Day, we're launching Shatter Syndicates. And Shatter Syndicates um, is being launched with uh, my partner, Alison Capen. If you guys know, she runs women, the Women's Startup Challenge, where it's a nonprofit, and she literally looks for um, the early stage companies that female founders that should have investment, but they don't know where to start. So she gives them that seed capital and it's a challenge. Anyway, so in honor of International Women's Day, that's our ability to take our power and to convert it into action. So thank you for that. Um, the next question I would say is, um, it's relevant to all of us, and I'd love to hear, go back to you, Hadia. Um, all, of, all three of us here on the stage, our parents have immigrated to the US from, you know, yours from Jamaica, mine from India, yours from um, Taiwan, Tracy. Um, and to think that if our parents hadn't come here, we wouldn't be making the changes that we're making. We wouldn't have the, um, the ability to do what we're doing today, right? So you've already talked about the Loretta's of the world, but how else would you say that your parents or your family's entrepreneurial journey has, to migration to the US has impacted your own entrepreneurial journey? Um, for me, I guess, leaning on my Loretta again, um, really instilling um, what I would say is a grit and hustle, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this type of work takes some type of mental toughness um, and uh, the ability to persist um, through rough times. And, you know, those are some of the things that I've uh, learned from my parents and my grandmother. And I think, you know, they've had to go through a variety of things being immigrants uh, in this country. And, and how would you say, what are some lessons that we can all learn from your parents or your family's experience? I can, I can come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So Tracy, what about you? What have um, your parents' journey to the U.S., how has that impacted your entrepreneurial journey? I mean, you touched on it in terms of didn't always feel like you should be in tech, but what else? Well, so I think there are two very big ways in which my parents' immigration here have impacted me in terms of doing startups and being in this tech space. One is um, I feel like they set me up to have so much more opportunity than they had. Um, and... I got to grow up in the Bay Area, very middle class, had access to a great university, and then now being here, I have so much capital, so this goes back a little bit to the prior question um, of how do we use our privilege. I feel like I've been giving so much privilege, I want to pay that forward. And then the other thing um, spe specific to startups where people talk about how risky it is, uh, I just compare my situation now to where my parents were moving to a foreign country where they didn't speak the language that well, had no family here and had to build new lives for themselves. Uh, and nothing I could do right now seems anywhere near as risky as that. Um, and I just remind myself, again, this goes to the privilege point. Um, I have really good support networks and even if my startup fails, I could work on five different failed startups and I would still be okay. Um, and that pushes me a little bit to try. Um, and even though it is tougher as a woman and as a person of color, I still think it's worth it to try. You have to try, right? That's the worst thing you can do is not try. So I would, I would just add a little bit to that, which is that, you know, with my parents, when they came um, from India, you know, the first generation is all about survival in a new country, right? You take the safe jobs. You take a way that, you know, that's going to support your family. So watching my parents take that safe path kind of is reverse psychology for me. I became the person that wanted to take a risk. Right? I didn't want the safe job. I was at a company for a few years, and it never made sense to me to work for someone else. I wanted to be my own boss, and that put me on my entrepreneurial journey. But to your point, our parents gave us that foundation to be able to do so. So thank you for that. Can, can I add? Absolutely. Okay, I'm answer. The <laughs> first back. time I hesitated because I uh, thought of a non-PC term that my mom used to tell me, and I was like, oh, I shouldn't say that on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it had to do with basically you know, putting on your big girl undies mm -hmm. and um, dealing with a, a lot of things. Um, but to, to that, you know, you talked about your parents um, taking the safe job. And there were times where my parents weren't offered um, certain safe jobs, so they had to make a way. And mm -hmm. so there's a phrase of like making a way out of no way. 
Um, mm -hmm. And this is why entrepreneurship became a strong theme in our, in our family, because if the jobs weren't there, then they had to be creative. So I think if any lesson um, I get from my parents, it has to be the theme of being creative. Um, someone told me, and I believe this is, I don't know who originally said this, but, um, but every problem um, invites the opportunity to be creative. I like that a lot. And, and what you said about the hustle factor, yes, it's true that all entrepreneurs hustle, but women have to exponentially hustle harder. So just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> um, next question, Tracy, I'll come back to you. Um, what would you tell a woman who's been turned down for funding? What would be your advice? What would you tell her? She's got this amazing product, wants to go to market, and it's been turned down for funding. Where does she go from here? <laughs> Um, the first thing I would say is, uh, to, the first thing I would do is acknowledge that there are systems that are unfair and that she should not take it too personally mm -hmm. if the system seems to be stacked against her. Sometimes it is hard to tell if you're getting discriminated against, but there's often that question still. So just to assure that there is a little of that and to not gaslight. Um, but then after that, I think it depends on the person, what they mm -hmm. want to do. For some, it makes sense to keep pounding on more doors, and there are more and more funds out there that want to back female founders. So potentially there's a way in through one of these yeah. new seed funds. Um, I, I feel like I see a new seed fund like every week that's trying to support women and underrepresented minorities. So there's more capital now. Uh, who knows how long it will last for. Um, for others, Maybe they don't want to keep pushing and they can shelve that idea, maybe come back to it a little bit later, um, get a, another job. Like There's many different potential paths and it depends on the person. Understood, I, and I agree with that. Um, this, I mean, many people in my network are turned down. Many women mm -hmm. in my network are turned down for funding all the time. Have you ever been turned down? Yes. Yeah. How did you, how did you yes, handle that? Um, what was your I advice to yourself? I think this week I was turned down for funding. <laughs> okay, so what was your advice to yourself? Uh, keep going. Yep. Just Absolutely. keep going. Um, it, I'm not going to be a fit for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not going to stop me. I'm going to be creative. Uh, when we launched our first program, we did it without program, you know, and so I was hacking together different <laughs> ideas of, okay, we're going to, you know, we, people need to understand venture capital, so I'm going to have some friends over here teach these students here, yeah. and, you know, but just keep going and find ways and opportunities to be creative. I agree with that, and, and to quote Ariana Grande, thank you, next. <laughs> <laughs> so, next question. Um, this is something that, you know, clearly we're all here to discuss, but we know that diversity makes businesses more profitable. When there's a woman on the board of a company, it, is 66, it has a higher return by 66% as opposed to a non-diverse team. More effective, more sustainable, yet there are so many positives to diversity. Why is there still so much resistance, Hadia? Because uh, it takes work. It diversity takes, takes work? Well, yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes work to, ch to change the status quo. Mm. Right, and the current um, industry, innovation in industry, was not really um, designed initially for uh, for non-white males, um, and so there was a pattern that was set for this industry. You know how funding how funding works, how people uh, find entrepreneurs, and um, a lot of us are trying to fit in the existing. Uh, status quo, uh, but it needs to change. Um, so I think a lot of people are resistant to that because mm -hmm. they don't want to do the work. It's the unknown. They, it's the unknown. Um, and a lot of people don't want to admit that it is going to take uh, funding solutions to, to change the status quo. So I, going I to commit into uh, action instead of having dialogue around it. And Tracy, I know that you've you know you've really raised the you know the profile of the issue of lack of you know lack of diversity through stats and and data. So how do you tackle this? How do you explain the resistance? I think the people who are in power right now and have privilege don't want to yield it. Even if they mm. say they do, it's very difficult to give up your position of power and privilege. And so, in addition to all the work that needs to be done, it's just very 
uncomfortable and difficult for people to say, I shouldn't be in this spot of power and maybe a woman of color should be instead. And so I've encountered a lot of this sort of skepticism and resistance in uh, work that I've done. And I think it comes from that um, feeling of insecurity and people wanting to believe that they own all of their success and that uh, they are there because they worked harder and they're better than the other people who aren't there. Isn't that funny? It's almost counterintuitive. You would think that the more people you let in, the more powerful you are, the more it enha enhances your brand. And yet here's the opposite of keeping people out. And I think that's a big part of what women, you know, want to do, should do for each other, right? We should be door openers, not gatekeepers for each other. So I think that's very critical. Well, I think there's something about gatekeeping, which means that your club is more exclusive. So it feels more prestigious. And I mean, even with like supply and demand economics, it can be more lucrative. If, for example, in engineering, if there's not enough engineers, then each mm -hmm. engineer can make more money. So if we keep all the non-white men out, then the white men <laughs> engineers get more money. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it can definitely be exclusive, but when you're already, you know, there's only one woman at the table or you're fighting for that seat at the table, I think that that is where um, the problem comes in and the gatekeeping comes in and that's where we need to open doors. So thank you for that. Um, Gitanjali touched on this earlier in her question and her answer about you know, imposter syndrome, right? So we've all been a minority in the room, at the table. Um, just give me quickly um, just something, how you've successfully pushed through um, being, feeling like the imposter or the self-doubt. Well, I think to myself, what would Beyonce do? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and I mean that I'm not, uh, I'm not a big uh, Beyonce stan. I mean, she's, she's you know, she's, a, she's awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, I watched this interview, like, I mean, this was years ago, but she talks about her being, like, really, sh like, her natural personality is, like, really shy. She talks about that's where Sasha Fierce comes through. And so I know that there are times where um, the self-doubt comes in, and, it's, and a lot of times it's unfounded, right? So I have to pull, push on myself, you know, play my, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the, Sorry, you're who rules the world? No, or who rules the world? <laughs> you know, put on my music, anything that to to make whatever Sasha Fierce to, to bring out the Sasha Fierce in me. So. That's that's great, and whatever it takes to get you to the next day, right? And and Tracy, what about you know for the men in your life, like the, that are in your life, what advice would you give them to be supportive to women, especially in this time of the Me Too movement that's happening across you know industries, every industry, venture, capital, politics, tech. <laughs> education, entertainment? I think first, really seek to understand the experience of women um, and do more than just like Facebook statuses and retweet. Yes. So I feel like I get a lot of that from people who pretend that they care a lot, but then don't actually do anything about it um, and act very surprised to hear some of these stories. Um, and in particular, the people who have never heard of a woman in their life getting harassed before, the question I would ask is, why don't the women in your life feel comfortable telling you these stories? And how can you position yourself so that you can start to hear them more and understand how you can actually be helpful? Um, I think that's very fundamental. And then for organizations and actually like longer term change, I think now there are more um, men who are in positions of power where they can make hiring decisions um, or leadership decisions that could be beneficial to women, but they don't have networks that are more diverse. And so when they're thinking of who to bring on as a partner or who to hire into some, um, some role, they don't know the people mm -hmm. to bring in at that time. And so even though they're looking at that point for some of them different background, they don't have those networks yet. And so I think it's a very long-term um, fix that we need to create culturally. And one thing you can start doing now is spend time with people who aren't like you and start building those connections. You understand those people and also just get to know them as people. And in the future when there are opportunities um, where you can give them out or help people into them, um, you have a more diverse network to share that with. That's great, and, and I, if I had to ask each of both of you to give me your number one action that people in this room can take, who are, and people that are you know, tuning in through live streaming are gonna go back and watch these videos, what would it be for them to join you in your mission and to help you become successful? Give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm only half joking. Um, but no. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, um, the work that we all are doing, um, <laughs> there's some type of investment that needs to, to go behind it. So um, we are a nonprofit, so um, donations are always appreciated, even if it's like $5 or $10. Um, but outside of that, I think just um, creating a general awareness of this industry, um, venture capital itself is very uh, opaque. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs who are seeking funding um, don't quite understand the industry. Um, so, you know, spend some time educating yourself on, um, you know, the venture capital industry and the way it works in terms of, you know, term, term sheets, how to, uh, evaluate your, your startup, um, the different financing op options, um, understanding that every VC has a different investment thesis. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the one thing that I see a lot of times people go and say, they won't fund me, they won't fund me. And it's like, well, if you have a software startup, you shouldn't be going to hardware investors. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, you know, outside of giving me your money, um, just, you know, spending some time educating yourself, especially in teaching others about this industry. Excellent, thank you. Tracy, your number one thing, how can we help? I don't have a very good concrete action item here, but one thing I wanna point out is that people will often talk about diversity and inclusion as a priority, but that is meaningless unless it is prioritized above something else. And so I think it's instructive to consider the decisions you're making where diversity and inclusion could be prioritized above something else and think about making those trade-offs. So it might mean that you have to hire more slowly because you're trying to ensure a more diverse uh, employee base, or it might mean that you don't choose to work at a company that is bad towards women and minorities, even if that offer is more attractive. Um, there's many different ways you support with where you um, purchase things from. Are you, are you supporting women and minority-owned small businesses? Just think about all the different choices you're making and where you can actually support diversity and inclusion and prioritize it. Excellent. Thank you. And of course, invest, invest, invest in women. So and thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you Yes. You don't want to do the. Now it's a great. Now it's a great honor for me to introduce th three of our Embrace Ambition applicants. First, we have Harleen Wahid Dale, CEO and attorney of Dale Slents. Mariana Ferron Gutierrez, CEO of Tico Coffee Roasters. And finally, Christina Padian, consultant of Oi Legal. I'll let you go. Harleen. Good evening, everyone. I am honored and humbled to be in um, such an amazing collective of people. I'm a first generation Indian American woman. I was born into a family where a woman is somehow inferior to a man and her role is to support the familial unit at the sacrifice of herself. This was in juxtaposition to an emphasis on obtaining an education for better employment and opportunity, a strange dichotomy to achieve. I remember as a child, I was told repeatedly by elders, including my father, girls should not talk so much. However, it is my ability to communicate effectively and boldly that has allowed me to zealously advocate for my clients in immigration, family law, and social security disability. I started my firm when I was six months pregnant with my second child. I knew that big firms would see my belly and make judgment on what I could contribute. So I decided to launch my own firm. In the past five years, I have built a successful law practice while going on to have a total of four children. <laughs> yes, that's by far the hardest. <laughs> I am the president of my children's nursery school. I advocate in the federal and state arena and challenging myself to multi-county uh, representation throughout the entire Central Valley. I feel that my continued persistence um, in my fields, often representing women and children of experiencing domestic violence, allows me to continue to empower women and support them. It allows me to give them a voice 
and achieve some form of small justice. I want all women to know that their voice is powerful and that they should use it to pursue whatever ambitions they may have. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mariana Fairon Gutierrez, and I was born and raised in Costa Rica in a small family. My life passed normally until I moved to the United States about 12 years ago. After having a career, my own income, and independence, this new life in this country came with beautiful things, but a hard time adapting, finding friends, and witnessing disparity in an area with so much money. After falling deep in desperation and feeling lonely for a long time, I slowly started to look for places to volunteer and reminding myself of the things that I dreamed when I was, when I was in college. I started to be comfortable to walk in the unknown and step by step began to create a new life personally and professionally. Today, I own a coffee roasting business called Tico Coffee Roasters that works and supports women farmers in different countries. I advise people who want to become entrepreneurs. I have given motivational talks for Latino youth to encourage them to follow their dreams, prepare themselves, and work hard. My company is a channel for people and companies to learn not just about coffee, but, all, but also about the challenges, stereotypes, and hurdles many families have to go through and overcome in order to put food at, in, their, in their tables uh, in the countries where the coffee is produced. I hope I have the opportunity to participate in this Embrace Ambition movement and continue my journey of learning and embracing what life has, to, has for all of us when we decide to have confidence and support for one another. Thank you. So first, I want to thank the foundation. This is such a cool event, and um, I feel really fortunate to be in a room full of so many incredible people, and I've been watching some of the live casts. It's astonishing how many amazing women there are out there. So I'm really excited to be part of this. Uh, my name is Christina Padian. I was in the middle of pursuing my ambitions and dream career as a lawyer in one of the country's best firms, but then my world shifted. At the age of 29, just after I returned from my honeymoon, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. It has been challenging, but anyone who has met me will tell you that I don't look or act or sound like a person with a degenerative illness. And I don't think I'm really defined by the disease. I've been fortunate to be mentored and supported by amazing teachers and healthcare professionals and friends, almost all of whom are incredible, brilliant, successful, kind women. There are some great men too, including my husband. We cannot do it alone. Having this illness has humbled me in ways I could not have anticipated and empowered me with empathy, compassion beyond what I knew I was capable of. As a lawyer, I mentored young female attorneys. Since I no longer practice law, I mentor collegiate women at UC Berkeley by advising the women of Kappa Kappa Gamma. We tackle issues of implicit racism, sexism, body identity, and sexual assault, to name a few in the chapter and at the university level. I'm a vocal advocate for women's rights and the rights of those whose voices are often unheard. I will not let multiple sclerosis hold me back from my ambitions to make the world a safe and equal place for all people. What a night, hmm? Thank you, Christina. And thank you to all of the amazing speakers Ashley, Tiffany, Harleen, Mariana, Hadia, Tracy, Shelley, and of course, Jatanjali. Pretty sure she's missing a day of school, but I think she's okay. Um, so tonight is really about action. We can talk about diversity, talk about em empowering women all day long, but it's really about action. So I challenge everyone here and everyone tuning in to think about how they can take this back to their communities, their families, their places of work, and create change, because we need it. 
This Friday is International Women's Day, and we hope you will join us by sharing a story of a woman who inspires you to embrace ambition by visiting our website, embraceambition.org. And don't forget, tomorrow we'll be live streaming from Dallas at 6.30 p.m. Central. Um, we have some other amazing young girls, uh, different track, different focus, but Isabel and Catherine Adams started their company Paper for Water when they were five and eight. Um, with a mission to empower children around the world to have clean water. They've raised $1.7 million and have created 200 clean water wells that are all sustainable. Um, they have partners like Neiman Marcus and the Four Seasons, so um, we'll have to all get advice from them on how they grew their business so quickly. We also have Mahisha Dillinger, who's working with Oprah to empower black female entrepreneurs through her show. Brooke Lopez and Gay Gaddis, so don't miss it. And thank you for joining us tonight. It was such a privilege, and thank you to our live stream viewers as well.